seat today. We're super excited because we are starting our new journal series called Abundant Living. Do you have your journals, everybody? Okay, so journal series. Who has done a journal series at Grace Hill? Okay, so journal series. Some of you are going, what is a journal series? Let me explain. In 2019, Ryan and I were really new to Grace Hill, and uh, we were praying about where the Lord was taking us, and we had this strong conviction, Lord, we want to be a church that is not biblically illiterate. We want to be a church that knows your word. And so through this like conviction we felt the Lord leading us through, we came up with this idea. Let me tell you, it's, it's not original, I'm sure. I'm not saying we created the idea, but this idea came to us to create journal series. And the intention of journal series was that we would have a tool in our hands that we would walk through a book of the Bible and go verse by verse. And so we started with Romans. Anybody remember Romans? Yeah. And so we have gone through books of the Bible, uh, verse by verse. I've got a lot here. I'm missing some, by the way. Some of you are going, wait a second. Didn't we do only one part one of Exodus? You're right. We did. But, and we were going to continue going through that. But we really felt the Lord for the first time since we started journal series, asking us to do a kind of topical series. And that is where abundant living came from. An abundant living, we, we did think we were going into Exodus, but the Lord really halted us, and it's better to follow his ways than our own, right? And I'm sure we'll come back to Exodus. We've got nothing against Exodus. Um, but this journal is going to be a really powerful tool for you. And what we want to encourage you to do is as the Lord speaks to you weekly through the sermons that are talked about, through your small group time that you're going to be uh, discussing this sermon, jot down things that the Lord is doing. Because I'm telling you right now, these are my personal journals from journal series. I have revelations from the Lord that are written down in these journals that I look back on and God awakens something in my heart again. But what's also cool is I can look back and see that my relationship with the Lord has deepened more and more through just reading his word and being in his word. So excited about the journal series. So good. Hey, every week on your journal, you're going to have Sunday sermon notes. And at the top, there's going to be a verse for the day that's kind of the foundational verse for where we're going to be going. Pastor Matt, who's our executive pastor of discipleship, wrote the overview, the introduction there in the front, front cover. So make sure you read that. We are thankful uh, for Pastor Matt and Hillary and the blessing that they are to grace. So, man. Okay, we're going to get into this today. The entire semester, now I'm talking from this point up until the Advent season, even through the Advent season, we are going to be talking about what it is to live in the abundant life that Christ offers every single one of us. We're going to cover many, many topics that all point to what it means to live an abundant life. And here's my challenge to you today. Do not miss a Sunday that you know you can be here. Do not miss a Sunday that you know you can be here because we're going to be covering so many topics. And what I know is that the Lord wants to speak to you. He wants to speak to me every single week. But let's take it a step further. I want to challenge you even more. When you hear the phrase abundant living, if you think of someone in your life right now that you know is not walking in abundant living. Maybe they are gripped by fear. Maybe they are gripped by worry. They have no peace in their life. I want you to invite them. Invite them here. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a coworker. Whatever it may be, you be here, but bring somebody with you. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Because Ryan and I's heart and that what we've really prayed and felt the Lord leading us to as we've thought, man, abundant living we're going to teach through it has been that God would truly transform your life. We want transformed lives here. So the verse that's going to be the foundation for this entire series, and they're going to put it up on the stream because I want us to say it together. This is where all of this is taking root, is the second half of John 10.10. 10. And I want you to read this lot with me. Okay, ready? Here we go. I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we open our ears. We open our hearts right here, right now. And Lord, we say, have your way in us. God, you're here to speak and meet with us in this place at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus says, I have come so they may have life and life to the full. Other translations say, have it more abundantly. The word abundantly here in the Greek is the word, and, and don't get on me if I'm saying it wrong. I'm thinking of someone in the room that's going to correct me if I'm wrong, but parisos. And it is a mathematical term meaning a surplus or more than enough. It can also be translated as exceptional. 
Jesus is saying here, I have come so that you may have a life of more than enough, a life of surplus, a life that is exceptional. At first glance, what we might initially come, what might initially come to our mind when we hear this abundant life is the promise of eternal life. And that is certainly part of what Jesus is saying here, that we do have abundant life in eternity with him when we receive him as our Lord and Savior. And he did in fact come for that very reason. But that cannot be all that Jesus is referring to because his words seem to point to a more current reality. He has come that we might have abundant life now. A life with more than enough joy, a life that has a surplus of peace. Can I get an amen? A life filled with purpose that is not defined by material wealth or success, but by a deep sense of fulfillment and contentment that can only be found in Christ. The abundant life is not the American dream. The abundant life is not the American dream. Is it wrong to succeed? Is it wrong to have wealth? No, but that is not what the abundant life is found in because the abundant life can be translated across every culture. The abundant life is for every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Therefore, it is for all people. This is abundant life. And I think... I'm, I'm on the same page that you are, that this sounds like something that I want. I don't think anybody in the room would say, you know what, I'll settle for miserable. No, I think we can agree. We want to have abundant life. We want a life that is full, like Jesus talks about. But I think if some of us were honest right now in the room, we would say, Lauren, that sounds awesome, but it almost sounds unattainable. Because right now, when I think of abundance, my life is abundant in worry. My life is abundant in fear. My life is full of unforgiveness and discontentment because we're all full of something. At some point, we made a decision, whether it was this morning, whether it was last week, whether it was 20 years ago, to fill our lives with something And that something becomes the navigator of our lives. It leads our thoughts. It leads our conversation. It leads our decision. It's the lens that we see others, ourselves, God, and even difficult situations. It's the lens that we see things through. And we know that we're going to face difficult situations. Ryan talked about it last week when he quoted John 16, 33. Jesus says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He's really honest with us, which aren't you thankful for that? He's like, in this world, you're gonna have trouble. You will face difficult situations. But I love that later on the verse, he tells us, take heart for I have overcome the world, which means he offers us an abundant life in the midst of a miserable world. He promises us a life that is far better than anything we could ever imagine. One that is reminiscent of 1 Corinthians 2, 9, when it says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And in John 10, when Jesus talks about abundance in regards to the life he has for us, I love that he doesn't just say, abundant life is available, now go make it happen. He doesn't do that. He actually lays out a path for us to follow. So we're going to read a few verses from John 10 today to see what that path is. Go with me there if you have your Bibles. We're going to read verse 9 through 15. John 10, verse 9 through 15. Starting in verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. 
The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me, I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. As we walk through this passage today, there are a few key things we need to understand if we're gonna walk in the abundant life that Christ has for us. And the first point today, if you're taking notes, is recognize that you have a real enemy. Every point today is gonna start with R, and that was not my intention, but those of you in the room that love organization, Jesus smiled on you, okay? Recognize that you have a real enemy. Verse 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. We have a real enemy. And I'm not just talking about the cockroaches that have made themselves known in my home right now. I'm, I'm dying. They feel like the real enemy, but we're taking care of them. We have a real enemy. Oftentimes we treat our family member like the real enemy. We treat the coworker out to get us as a real enemy or the friend that stabbed us in the back. But we need to understand we have a real enemy that has our destruction in mind. Now you might say, Lauren, that's not a very encouraging word. Listen, it's the reality. Ephesians 6, 12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And here in John 10, Jesus is warning us, the enemy, your real enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. And his plan never changes. Earlier in the chapter of John 10, Jesus talks about how this enemy, he calls him the thief, isn't just someone that comes in and walks through the door, but he says he sneaks in. He sneaks in. The thing about the enemy is that his tactics are not always obvious. A lot of times we can look at good and evil and think they should be just blatantly obvious, that it should be very obvious, but the enemy is sneaky. I think about the Garden of Eden, when the enemy comes as a serpent to Eve and he tells her, well, it, it's not so bad for you to eat of the, the tree of good and evil. And he sneaks in and he plays on her flesh desires and she eats of the apple and doesn't even understand the reality and the depth of what just happened because she was deceived. He does the same thing to you and I we can easily fall into a mindset of, well, that's not that much of a sin. Well, that show isn't so bad to watch. I mean, I've seen worse. Or I kind of have a relationship with God because I, I read my Bible six months ago for a few minutes. And then we walk around going, why am I not living an abundant life? Because typically the enemy who is sneaky, it's one decision at a time. It's one small step at a time. And before you know it, you're farther than you intended to be. I read this quote concerning this thought that I, I thought was so good. It said, a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways and will not find contentment when their allegiance is toward the things of the world and not solely towards God. This double-minded idea is part of that foundation that the enemy wants you to lay in your life. Notice I didn't say the foundation that the enemy is going to lay in your life because he has no power over us when we choose to follow Christ. His goal is for you to be double-minded, to have one foot in and one foot out. Because an abundant life is not found in a double-minded person. It can't be. And so we need to recognize that we have a real enemy that is working to steal and kill and destroy any chance of us receiving that life because he knows the power of someone that makes the decision to fully live for Christ. So he wants a double-minded people. And he doesn't only want to take what from you in this world, but his ultimate goal is to ruin your eternity with Jesus. He is daily, daily trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And church, we need to start calling his bluff. 
We need to start calling it out for what it actually is. We need to realize that every day we will face the temptation to fall into what the enemy sells as good enough, which actually is not good at all. And it's not the life that the Lord is wanting us to live. You have to realize that what the enemy offers is counterfeit. It's not the real thing. It's just a dupe. Now, if you know me at all, you would probably know that I am a huge bargain hunter. Like I live for the hunt. I love it. It's a game to me. And it's very, very rare. My husband can attest to this. It is very rare that I pay full price for anything. I just, I, I'm always, my mindset is always, nope, I can find a better deal. I can find a better deal. It happened to me yesterday. I'm not going to go into it, but it was awesome. <laughs> but I'm a bargain hunter. I love it. But there are times where I will fall for a dupe. Absolutely. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's super frustrating. Like this happened to me last year. I see this purse. I'm not a big purse person, but I liked this purse. It was cute. And I saw the designer style and I was like, oh man, there's a dupe out there. There's a dupe. I just know there's a dupe. And so I'm searching, researching all this stuff. Sure enough, there's a dupe made for people like me. And so I purchased this purse and I get it home. I kid you not, it lasted one day. One day, the metal piece on the handle snapped and there was no way of fixing it because also if there's a way to fix it, your girl's gonna find it. I will, I will wear it. I have worn things that have been zip tied. You just don't know, okay? <laughs> but it was a dupe and it, it was terrible, terrible. In the same way, the enemy is going to offer you peace that is counterfeit. He's going to offer you joy that is counterfeit because it's not the real thing. And what it does, it only brings us further into emptiness. It only brings us further into brokenness. So don't settle for the counterfeit. When you have the real thing, the enemy, it wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And we have to recognize that. So what are some ways, just really quick, what are some ways that we can all relate to that the enemy would come in and steal, kill, and destroy? How does he use it? Distraction. What does distraction do? It steals your focus from the Lord. Discontentment kills your joy. Bitterness destroys your relationships. Worry steals your peace. Understand how he works. He doesn't just come in and say, hey, I'm here to steal, kill, and destroy everything from you. No, he sneaks in one decision at a time, one step at a time. First Peter 5, 8 says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's looking. John 8, says, his lies caused death and destruction. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of of lies. Recognize his lies and call them out. We may have a real enemy, but are you ready for the good news? We also have a very real God who is victorious over every plan that the enemy has against you, who is not intimidated by his plans, who stands as the door and the gate as your good shepherd to keep him from taking ground in your life. I love this quote that C.S. Lewis said concerning the enemy. He says, on the back of Satan's neck is a nail-scarred footprint. On the back of Satan's neck is a nail-scarred footprint. We serve a victorious God who is victorious over the enemy and the plan that he has against you. But I think the question would be, how do we recognize the plan of the enemy? How do we recognize this real enemy that we have? The second point in your notes today is this. Receive the Lord as your shepherd. Receive the Lord as your shepherd. Right after Jesus says in verse 10 of John 10 that he came to give us life, a life that is full and abundant. He says this in the following verses. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
Jesus uses the idea of a shepherd and a sheep here as a way to connect to people of that day, but it also is a very easy translation for us to understand, even though I, I would bet to say none of us really know a legitimate shepherd. The idea of a shepherd and his sheep is used so many times in scripture. And Jesus is saying here that he is the shepherd to reveal the path of how we can truly obtain abundant life in him. As I studied the relationship of sheep and their shepherd, the thing that was most apparent to me is that the sheep are completely dependent upon the shepherd. Here's some things that happen if they don't have the shepherd. They are prone to wander. They are quick to make dumb decisions and not the right decisions. Sound like anybody? Without the shepherd, they are incapable of having a good and full life because their entire life is dependent upon him. I decided to research fully what would happen to a sheep that did not have a shepherd. And here are some things I found. Without the guidance of the shepherd, sheep move around aimlessly wandering here and there, getting lost and generally paying little heed to the dangers around them. Their wool overgrows, it becomes matted, heavy, dirty, is infected with parasites. This infects them with diseases and internal worms, which may reduce their survival rate because without their shepherd, their hooves are uncared for, which may make it harder for them to move. Unintended sheep are usually a sorry sight to see. There are a lot of unfortunate things that can happen to them. When we try to live our life without Jesus being the shepherd, without following his teachings and having true relationship with him, we, like the sheep without their shepherd, live a life that feels heavy. We live a life that feels chaotic and tangled like that matted wool of the sheep. And like the parasites that have attached themselves to the sheep and are creating diseases and sickness in their body, worry and fear infect us the same way. And we have no chance of walking in true freedom, which is exactly what the Lord wants for us. When the good shepherd is in charge, that is Jesus, we don't feel that type of heaviness. We don't feel when we are aimlessly trying to find our way through life, we don't feel like we're doing that. We don't feel the infection of worry and fear, not to say and hear me that we won't feel worry and fear, but they will not infect us. You get what I'm saying? In fact, Matthew eleven thirteen, 13, Jesus promises something quite miraculous when we allow him to be the shepherd of our lives. He actually says, when you let me lead, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That is part of what we receive when we allow him to be our shepherd and we live in the abundance he gives. But we have to understand saying, Lord, you can lead me. Lord, you can shepherd me, are only words if we don't follow him. We can say all day, the Lord is the shepherd of my life, but if our actions do not follow them, we just create more frustration. As the shepherd, Jesus wants to come in. As you let him be the shepherd and you follow his ways, he will care for you. He will correct you. I'm thankful for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I love what Psalm 23 says happens when the Lord is truly our shepherd. And this Psalm was written by King David, who himself was a shepherd in his earlier years. He starts off the verse and he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Mm. I lack nothing. Some of you in the room are going, is that even possible? Can I tell you it is? When we are living in the abundance that Jesus has for us, to be able to say we lack nothing, you might say, Lauren, is that even possible? In Philippians 4, 11, 13, I know I'm saying a lot of scriptures, so just jot them down and you can go read them. But Philippians 4, 11 through 13, Paul speaks of this thought of lacking nothing when he writes to the church in Philippi and he says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Now pause, because <laughs> that always hits me. Paul says he's learned that when in whatever situation, 
That means all of them. He's learned to be content. And you might be here and you say, well, then Paul's never faced anything. Let me just remind you, Paul was beaten. He received many, many death threats. He was hurt by friends. He was rejected and persecuted for his faith in ways that we will never experience. And yet he's able to say he's content. The verses go on to say, Paul says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty or hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think it's safe to say that Paul here is walking an abundant life. He has learned, notice, I love this. He says, I've learned. So this is something that didn't come natural to him. In fact, we see in in some of his other writings that he talks about how he daily dies to his flesh. He even says, why do I do the things I don't want to do and not do the things I want to do? There's this struggle, but he's saying, listen, I've learned that this life is way better. I've learned that contentment in Jesus gives me life and life to the full, abundant life. He learned how to walk in the abundant life, which is a life of true contentment that is only found in Jesus. And the learning happens when we daily make the decision to allow Jesus to be the shepherd of our lives. Laying down our desires to take up God's desires and follow him. Because receiving him as our shepherd sets the foundation That's what we're doing today. We're setting the foundation that leads to abundant life, to have real joy, to have the peace that really passes the understanding that the Bible talks about. It's available to you. It's available to me. But we have to receive the Lord as our shepherd. We have to become like the sheep fully dependent upon Jesus, fully dependent. And I think something that's, this kind of a side note, but something that really came to me this week, I feel like the Lord was speaking. Something that we really have to understand is that Jesus as our shepherd is not a role he delegates. Jesus as our shepherd is not a role that he delegates. Understand that he does not tire of leading you. He does not tire of guiding you. He can use wise people around us to speak in our lives. But if we are running to them for the joy, if we're running to them first for the wisdom, we missed it. Jesus as your shepherd is not a role he's going to delegate. He is the point. He is the only shepherd and should be the only shepherd of our lives. And this can be really difficult for us when we feel like we have to wait. It can be really difficult, but can I remind you of something that always just awakens my heart? Our God is a God who keeps his promises. So when he says that while you wait, he will renew your strength, he will. When he says he will never leave you or forsake you, he won't. When he says you, he is always for you. He's not against you. He is. He's for you. When he says he will supply all of your needs according to his riches and his glory, he will because abundant life is only found in him. Everything flows from him because he is the point. He is the answer. It is and will only ever be Jesus. Another C.S. Lewis quote, he's, he's my guy today. He said, God can't give us peace and happiness apart from himself because there is no such thing. <laughs> he can't give it apart from him because there's no such thing. It's only through him. 
And it's only through him that you will find what your heart truly desires. He is the answer to abundant living. He is the answer to recognizing the plan that the enemy has against you. So receive him as your shepherd. The third thing today, realize that the abundant life is for his glory. Peyton, I'll ask you to come up. Realize that the abundant life is for his glory. When I think about examples in the Bible, people in the Bible, that I can recognize a life of abundance, and there's many that we could point out, but one that really was just sticking with me this week was the story of Joseph. Joseph with the coat of many colors. I would have loved to see that. As you read through Joseph's story, what it looks like on the surface is that he's just dealt a bad hand after a bad hand. His brothers who were jealous of him sell him into slavery in Egypt. He's so wounded by that. You can see it in the story that it's something that he has to really work through for years and years and years as any of us would be so wounded that his own brothers would sell him into slavery. As he's sold, he is a servant for one of the high officials in Egypt. And then all of a sudden he's accused of something that he didn't actually do, but he has to pay the consequences and he's put in prison. And over and over, we just see David taking one step forward, but what seems to be taking a lot of steps back. But something that struck me so much is how the Lord is glorified through every single moment. The word tells us over and over that the Lord was with Joseph, but then it quickly comes to say, and Joseph trusted the Lord. In fact, there are so many scriptures throughout his story that we can see God is being glorified as Joseph is not relying on his own ability, but he's like a sheep to a shepherd. He's so dependent upon the Lord. He just trusts him that even all the idols in Egypt couldn't take his heart away. When he's the servant for Potiphar, the high ranking official in Genesis 39, three through four, It says when his master Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success. Notice he doesn't say when he noticed that Joseph was so smart and Joseph was so great and Joseph was so capable. No, it was the Lord Potiphar saw. The Lord is glorified. We see him glorified as Joseph is wrongfully thrown in prison. He quickly finds favor, which we also see as part of Joseph's story with God being with him. But it says when he's in prison that the warden who's over the prisoners, but puts Joseph as the top prisoner, I guess it's a thing. It says he paid no attention to anything Joseph did. He was like, if Joseph's doing it, I don't even have to double check it, but why? It says because the Lord was with Joseph. God is glorified. We see the Lord glorified as Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams. When Pharaoh, the leader of all of Egypt, who is serving all of these false idols, he says, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. Notice he didn't start by saying, since Joseph, you are so gifted. He says, no, since God, God receives the glory. You gotta get this. Joseph in the end restores his relationship with the very brothers that had so wounded him. He does something a lot of us can't do and Joseph couldn't do it either without Jesus or without, the, without God helping him. And instead of living in unforgiveness and blaming God for all the things that had happened to him, he has this incredible only God-given viewpoint where he says, God did this because look at all the people that are saved from the famine. God receives the glory. Joseph is walking in an abundant life to the world that doesn't make sense. How can someone, how can someone trust the Lord when they have been 
totally excommunicated from their family? How can someone trust the Lord when they feel like they have favor and then everything falls apart? Many of us, me included, would have said, forget it. Forget it. But Joseph had taken in his heart the Lord as his shepherd, which meant there was peace in the storm there was joy unspeakable even when there wasn't explanation there was trust that came in there was faith where doubt was trying to creep in i just believe it with all of my heart we can see it in his story he walked in the abundant life that jesus talks about this life that even to the world may look like we don't have much Even if to the world, we look like we have all that we have in the world, we have to know that our joy and our peace is not found in those things. Our contentment will never be found in those things. It's only through Jesus. My joy and my peace are not dictated by my circumstances because Jesus is my shepherd and I lack nothing. That should be the cry of our heart. And when we walk in that mindset, When we walk in that abundant living, our life will bring him glory because it's gonna affect the people around you. It's gonna affect your family. It's gonna affect your kids. It's gonna affect your friends. It's gonna affect your coworkers because they're watching if your word aligns with your action. Does your faith that you say from your mouth actually follow your life? And if it does, it will bring glory to God because it's about him. All of this is about him, but he's so good that he cares for us as the shepherd. He doesn't leave us to wander. He doesn't leave us to be out on our own wondering if we're ever gonna find the answer to our peace, the the answer to our worry, the answer to our fear, the answer to our discontentment. He comes in and he says, not only will I fill you, not only will I set you free, but I'm gonna use your life to shine out for my glory. It's for his glory. And as we go through this series, I'm telling you, the Lord is going to set you free. I claim that over over this house. I declare that over this house. I prophesy that over this house. You will be set free. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna be so full of the joy of the Lord. Like, have you ever met someone that just came to the Lord for the first time? Man, I'm just like, splash that on me again. Like, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation because they can't, they cannot talk about it. Like I think about my dad who is a first generation Christian in our family as far as we can go back and, and he had the worst upbringing. It was terrible. He left house at 16 just for safety and because there was a lot of things going on. But he talks about, there's a, there was a girl in his school that met him at his locker and she said, Joe Childs, you are a sinner and you need Jesus. And he was bad, y'all. Now, I wouldn't suggest everybody going up to people and saying, you're a sinner, you need Jesus. He said, I had no business going to a church that night, but he went. Radically set free. Radically. The definition of radically. And he said when he went home, he stayed up all night. Someone had given him a Bible and he couldn't put it down. He's just like, I gotta have more. I gotta have more. Baptizing the Holy Spirit in his bunk bed. No one there. And he had to tell everybody. And now, my grandfather saved. My grandmother saved. My uncle is saved. My aunt is on the way. We're getting there. But his life gave God glory. And because of the abundant life he began to walk in one step at a time. Listen, sanctification is a very real thing. It wasn't perfect. Paul talks about there's things I do that I don't want to do. And they, listen, God's grace is enough for you. But it's letting him be the leader of your life. Let him be the shepherd of your life. It's got to be that we get quicker at the returning. Because abundant life is available to you. So what are we doing? Why are we wasting time? I know that the Lord is speaking to you now. He has spoken to me. I don't know if you can tell. He has spoken to me so much this week. I'm so grateful to the Lord. 
but he wants to continue to speak to you. And as we start this first week of this series and learning what abundant life is, we need to set the foundation with these thoughts. We need to recognize we have a real enemy. Listen, we're gonna go through a lot of weeks with a lot of topics and some of them are gonna hit really hit home for you. And the enemy who is sneaky and has the plan to steal, kill and destroy, he will amplify lies in your mind. I'm just gonna tell you. He's gonna try to amplify things in your mind that you're unlovable. You'll never beat depression. Worry is just part of your personality. Freedom is not an option for you. Your marriage is hopeless. Your kids are a lost cause. These are lies that he's gonna try to amplify in your life. Call his bluff. Call him out. We've gotta receive the Lord as our shepherd. My prayer for you this week is that you would learn to turn up the volume of the Holy Spirit and turn down the volume of the enemy. Turn up the volume of the Holy Spirit through reading his word this week when you're studying, read his word, increase your prayer time. Being in relationship with the Father so that his voice drowns out the lies of the enemy because when you take him as your shepherd, you recognize the lies of the enemy and you begin to replace them. You begin to say, wait, I am loved. I can walk in freedom. My marriage is not hopeless because God is a God of restoration and forgiveness. Depression will not have the final say in my life. This happens when you receive him as your shepherd. And then lastly, all of it comes to this, we realize it's for his glory. So that our lives can be a witness of his goodness of his grace to those around us. And all of this is laid upon him being the shepherd. Because when he's the shepherd, your understanding of abundant life shifts, just changes. You see the world differently because you're taking on his mindset, taking on the mind of Christ. I don't wanna leave you without some practical steps that I want you to take as we're, we're starting this series. And maybe you wanna jot a couple of these down just as a, like a reminder to have these thoughts later in your journal. I want you to write out what are the lies of the enemy that you need to recognize. Now that we've talked about who he is and what he does, what do you need to write down? And then what I want you to do in your journal is I want you to replace that lie with the truth. I want you to write down, if you say, if you say the lie would be, I will never beat depression. I want you to write down where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom and I will be set free from depression. Replace the lie, write that down this week. Then I want you to write down out areas of your life that you have not received the Lord as your shepherd. Where are you not letting, God, letting the Lord lead and guide your life? Maybe you have been in a double-minded mindset and the Lord is shedding light on your heart right now that you're realizing I have one foot in, but I have one foot out and I've got to make the change. Maybe there's things this week that you're gonna say, Lord, I need to repent of that and I need your grace to come in. I need your forgiveness. And then lastly, I want you to pray through this series as God molds you and shapes you, as he prepares your heart, as he readies your heart for healing and for freedom. I just want you to be praying this week, Lord, I, I open my heart, I open my hands, I open my ears. God, I am open to you to do what you wanna do. Father, we thank you for your word. God, it is the bread of life, God. It is what truly sustains us. God, I thank you, God. A prayer that I pray so often, Lord, is I thank you that you are a personal God. God, that you meet each and every one of us right where you are. Lord, it blows my mind. I can't even comprehend it. And yet you do it. And Lord, I pray this week, Lord, as, as we are 
starting this series of abundant living, Lord God, as we have set the foundation for all that you're wanting to do. God, I pray that you would speak to us the lies that the enemy has tried to let take root in our heart. Lord, and even if they have taken root, Lord, nothing is too hard for you. And God, I pray that there would be an uprooting this week. And God, I pray that hearts, Lord, in the room, Lord, that could say, I don't let the Lord be the shepherd of my life. And because of it, I'm infected just like the sheep with all the things that are bringing me down. I'm infected with worry. I'm infected with fear. I'm infected with bitterness, Lord God, that we would recognize it, Lord, and that we would receive you as the shepherd. Ready our hearts, Lord. God, because I know your desire is to truly transform us into the image of your son. So God, I pray the heart of this house would be, Lord, have your way. Have your way, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 How good is the Lord? Mm, he's so good. I'm praying for you this week. Ryan and I are praying for you. I really challenge you to do those practical steps that I was talking about and get ready for the Lord to do something truly profound this entire semester and bring someone with you, okay? All right, I pray that you have a great week. We're excited to see you next week as we continue in this series. We love you, Ryan, and I love you so much. What an honor it is to lead you here at Grace Hill. Hug somebody as you leave. If you didn't get to at intermission, uh, there's always a new face to meet. We love you.